politics, and current events. From the housetops, coming up next. We begin our program with a reading from The Liturgical Year by Abbot Garen J. The stigmata of St. Francis is of great mystical significance. The man-god still lives in the church by the continual reproduction of his mysteries, in this his bride, making her a faithful copy of himself. In the 13th century, while the charity of many had grown cold, the divine fire burned with redoubled ardor in the hearts of a chosen few. It was the hour of the church's passion, the beginning of that series of social defections, with their train of denials, treasons, and derisions, which ended in the proscription we now witness. The cross had been exalted before the eyes of the world. The bride was now to be nailed thereto with her divine spouse. After having stood with him in the praetorium, exposed to the insults and blows of the multitude, like an artist selecting a precious marble, the Holy Spirit chose the flesh of St. Francis as the medium for the expression of his divine thought, He thereby manifested to the world the special direction he intended to give to the sanctity of souls. He offered to heaven a first and complete model of the new work he was meditating, the perfect union upon the very cross, the mystical body with its divine head. Francis was the first to be chosen for this honor, but others were to follow. And henceforward, here and there, through the world, the stigmata of our blessed Lord will ever be visible in the church. We are indebted to the seraphic doctor, St. Bonaventure, for the admirable history of this event. He writes, Two years before the faithful servant and minister of Christ, Francis, gave up his spirit to God, he retired alone into a high place, which is called Mount Alvernia, and he began a forty days fast in honor of the archangel St. Michael. The sweetness of heavenly contemplation was poured out on him more abundantly than usual, till burning with the flame of celestial desires, he began to feel an increasing overflow of these divine favors. While the seraphic ardor of his desires thus raised him up to God, and the tenderness of his love and compassion was transforming him into Christ, the crucified victim of excessive love, one morning, about the feast of the exaltation of the Holy Cross, as he was praying on the mountainside, he saw what appeared to be a seraph, with six shining and fiery wings coming down from heaven. The vision flew swiftly through the air and approached the man of God, who then perceived that it was not only winged, but also crucified, for the hands and feet were stretched out and fastened to a cross. While the wings were arranged in a wondrous manner, two being raised above the head, two outstretched in flight, and the remaining two crossed over and veiling the entire body. As he gazed, Francis was much astonished, and his soul was filled with mingled joy and sorrow. The gracious aspect of him, who appeared in so wonderful and loving a manner, rejoiced him exceedingly, while the sight of his cruel crucifixion pierced his heart with a sword of sorrowing compassion. He who appeared outwardly to Francis taught him inwardly that although weakness and suffering are incompatible with the immortal life of a seraph, yet this vision had been shown to him to the end that he, Christ's lover, might learn how his whole being was to be transformed into a living image of Christ crucified, not by martyrdom of the flesh, but by the burning ardor of his soul. After a mysterious and familiar conversation, the vision disappeared, leaving the saint's mind burning with seraphic ardor and his flesh impressed with an exact image of the crucified, as though after the melting power of that fire it had next been stamped with a seal. For immediately the marks of nails began to appear in his hands and feet, their heads showing in the palms of his hands and the upper part of his feet, and their points visible on the other side. There was also a red scar on his right side, as if it had been wounded by a lance, and from which blood often flowed, staining his tunic and underclothing. Francis, now a new man, honored by this new and amazing miracle, and by a hitherto unheard of privilege, adorned with the sacred stigmata, came down from the mountain, bearing with him the image of the crucified, not carved in wood or stone by the hand of an artist, 
but engraved upon his flesh by the finger of the living God. The seraphic man well knew that it is good to hide the secret of the king, wherefore, having been thus admitted into the king's confidence, he strove as far as in him lay to conceal the sacred marks. But it belongs to God to reveal the great things which he himself has done, and thus, after impressing those signs upon Francis in secret, he publicly worked miracles by means of them, revealing the hidden and wondrous power of the stigmata by the signs wrought through them. Pope Benedict XI willed that this wonderful event, which is so well attested and in pontifical documents has been honored with the greatest praises and favors, should be celebrated by a yearly solemnity. Afterwards, Pope Paul V, wishing the hearts of all the faithful to be enkindled with the love of Christ crucified, extended the feast to the whole church. O standard bearer of Christ and of his church, we wish with the apostle and with thee to glory in nothing save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We desire to bear in our souls the sacred stigmata which adorned thy holy body. To him whose whole ambition is to return love for love, every suffering is a gain. Persecution has no terrors, for the effect of persecutions and sufferings is to assimilate him, together with his mother the church, to Christ persecuted, scourged, and crucified. It is with our whole hearts that we pray with the church, O Lord Jesus Christ, who when the world was growing cold, didst renew the sacred marks of thy passion in the flesh of the most blessed Francis, to inflame our hearts with the fire of divine love, mercifully grant that by his merits and prayers we may always carry the cross and bring forth worthy fruits of penance, who livest and reignest with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, world without end. Amen. From the House Tops Radio features the same Catholic doctrine, spirituality, church history, and apologetics published for over 40 years in From the House Tops magazine. This program, dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, promotes her cause in the age-old conflict with the powers of darkness. From the House Tops on WQPH 89.3 FM. September 15th, Our Lady of Sorrows. This is the permanent feast dedicated to the mysteries of Our Lady's Sorrows. There is also a movable feast, and that is commemorated on the sixth Friday of every Lent. No heart ever burned with love of God or was united with Him more intimately in grief than was the heart of Mary. Simeon, in prophecy, told Our Lady, Thine own soul a sword shall pierce. The Seven Sorrows of Our Lady. 1. The Prophecy of Simeon. 2. The Flight into Egypt. 3. The Losing of Jesus in the Temple when He was 12 years old. 4. Mary's Meeting with Jesus on the Way to Calvary, the Fourth Station of the Cross. 5. The Crucifixion and Death of Jesus, the Twelfth Station of the Cross. 6. The Taking Down of the Body of Jesus from the Cross and Placing it in Mary's Arms the thirteenth station of the cross. Seven, the burial of Jesus in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea on the afternoon of the first Good Friday, the fourteenth and last station of the cross. True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary by St. Louis de Montfort The Author's Prayer to Jesus Christ I here turn for one moment to thee, O sweet Jesus, to complain lovingly to thy divine majesty that the greater part of Christians, even the most learned, do not know the necessary union there is between thee and thy holy mother. Thou, Lord, art always with Mary, and Mary is always with thee, and she cannot be without thee, else she would cease to be what she is. She is so transformed into thee by grace that she lives no more. She is as though she were not. It is thou only, my Jesus, who livest and reignest in her more perfectly than in all the angels and the blessed. Ah, if we knew the glory and the love which thou receivest in this admirable creature, we should have very different thoughts both of thee and her from what we have now. She is so intimately united with thee that it were easier to separate the light from the sun, the heat from the fire. Nay, it were easier to separate from thee all the angels and the saints than the divine Mary, because she loves thee more ardently and glorifies thee more perfectly 
than all the other creatures put together. We'll be back with more from the housetops after this break. Hello friends, this is Father Wade Menezes with the Fathers of Mercy and EWTN, and I want to thank you for listening to Queen of Perpetual Help Radio, WQPH 89.3 FM. So we're here at Sacred Hearts Church, and I ran into a very dear friend, Deacon Patino. Uh, Deacon, you know, it's the summer, and people's faith is getting cold while the heat is coming. What can people do to stimulate and rise up their level of love for God in the summer when it's so hot? I think that the most important thing right now is to become closer to the Eucharist, to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. For those Catholics that have fallen away, for those Catholics that want to find a reason why to come to church. The best and the greatest gift that the Lord has given to us is His presence, body, soul, and divinity in the the Holy Eucharist. So I encourage all of you to come before Jesus in in the presence in the tabernacle and talk to Him and let Him talk to you. Jesus wants to hear you. So I invite all of you to come before the Blessed Sacrament and pray and talk to Him and tell Him how much you love Him. God bless you all. Gabriel made an important appearance on WQPH's Local Matters, and he is making a statement about the following. Dear Secretariat of Pro-Life Activities, I am a faithful Catholic in the Archdiocese of Boston. I am reaching out because of current events related to the trial and conviction of several pro-life leaders who allegedly violated the FACE Act during a rescue mission at a Washington, D.C. abortion facility. The harsh persecution of these mostly Catholic pro-lifers is very concerning and yet has received little attention in even Catholic churches and media. I ask that the USCCB please raise the alarm about this trial so that Catholics can offer prayer and support to these individuals who sought only to save innocent lives. Additionally, I ask that the USCCB publicly condemn the proceedings of this biased trial, which seeks to make an example and intimidate other pro-lifers. Your voice is important to help ensure that justice will prevail and to push back against the increasing aggression of parts or our government towards pro-life individuals. Thank you. Best regards to all. Gabriel. You can show your support by writing to ProLife at usccb.org. On the WQPH 89.3 FM community calendar, St. Bernard's Parish at St. Camillus Church in Mechanic Street in Fitchburg is looking for doors for their days of adoration. Adoration is currently Monday after the 8.30 a.m. daily mass till 7 p.m. and Tuesdays after the 8.30 mass till 4 p.m. They're also looking for adorers on Sundays that'll be running from after the 8 a.m. mass till after the 6 p.m. mass on Sundays. If you have an interest in doing adoration on either of those days or in the Sunday adorations, email us at wqph893 at comcast.net that's wqph893 at comcast.net subject line adoration this has been the wqph 89.3 fm community calendar join father elias mary of friars of the immaculate in prayer do you say well the prayer of the handmaids of the eucharist Then let us pray it together. Most sacred heart of Jesus, truly present in the Holy Eucharist, I consecrate my body and soul to be entirely one with your heart, being sacrificed at every instant on all the altars of the world and giving praise to the Father, pleading for the coming of his kingdom. Please receive this humble offering of myself. Use me as you will for the glory of the Father and the salvation of souls. Most Holy Mother of God, never let me be separated from your Divine Son. Please defend and protect me as your special child. Amen. Amen. So it's kind of like a form of the morning offering, but it has a very Eucharistic accent to it that Jesus present in the Blessed Sacrament. We're making reparation to Him with Our Lady, to His Sacred Heart for all the offenses given to Him from mankind. Our Lady, though, did say to Sister when she gave her that prayer, she said to her, reminded her, please, when you pray this prayer, say truly present, because the sisters did not have the word truly present in the original prayer. 
truly present. And that's why I think the messages of Our Lady at Akita are so important because they're stressing reparation to our Lord for the offenses committed against him in the Blessed Sacrament. And I think that's also why the interpretation that Father Yasuda had of why Sister had the wound in her left hand and the statue in the right hand was because of the offenses given to God because of the introduction of the abuse of communion in the hand which, of course, offers so many offenses to our Lord because people are not consciously aware that our Lord is truly present in every little particle of the host. You're listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg. After that, my sweet master, is it not an astonishingly pitiable thing to see the ignorance and the darkness of all men here below in regard to thy Holy Mother? I speak not so much of idolaters and pagans who, knowing thee not, care not to know her. I speak not even of heretics and schismatics who care not to be devoted to thy holy mother, being separated as they are from thee and thy holy church. But I speak of Catholic Christians, and even of doctors among Catholics, who make profession of teaching truth to others, and yet know not thee nor thy holy mother, except in a speculative, dry, barren, and indifferent manner. These men speak but rarely of thy Holy Mother and of the devotion we ought to have to her, because they fear, so they say, lest we should abuse it and do some injury to thee in honoring thy Holy Mother too much. If they hear or see any one devoted to our Blessed Lady, speaking often of his devotion to that good Mother in a tender, strong, and persuasive way, and as a secure means without delusion, as a short road without danger, as an immaculate way without imperfection, and as a wonderful secret of finding and loving thee perfectly, they cry out against him and give him a thousand false reasons by way of proving to him that he ought not to talk so much about our Blessed Lady, that there are great abuses in that devotion, and that we must direct our energies to destroy these abuses and to speak of thee rather than to incline people to devotion to our Blessed Lady, whom they already love sufficiently. We hear them sometimes speak of devotion to our Blessed Lady, not for the purpose of establishing it and persuading men to embrace it, but to destroy the abuses which are made of it. And all the while these teachers are without piety or tender devotion toward thyself, simply because they have none for Mary. They regard the rosary and the scapular as devotions proper for weak and ignorant minds, without which men can save themselves. And if there falls into their hands any poor client of Our Lady who says his rosary, or has any other practice of devotion toward her, they soon change his spirit and his heart. Instead of the rosary, they counsel him the seven penitential psalms. Instead of devotion to the Holy Virgin, they counsel him devotion to Jesus Christ. O my sweet Jesus, do these people have thy spirit? Do they please thee in acting thus? Does it please thee when, for fear of displeasing thee, we neglect doing our utmost to please thy mother? Does devotion to thy holy mother hinder devotion to thyself? Does she attribute to herself the honor we pay her? Does she head a faction of her own? Is she a stranger who has no connection with thee? Does it displease thee that we should try to please her? Do we separate or alienate ourselves from thy love by giving ourselves to her and honoring her? Yet, my sweet master, the greater part of the learned could not discourage devotion to thy holy mother more, and could not show more indifference to it, even if all that I have just said were true. Thus have they been punished for their pride." Keep me, Lord, from their sentiments and their practices, and give me some share of the sentiments of gratitude, esteem, respect, and love which thou hast in regard to thy holy mother, so that the more I imitate and follow her, the more I may love and glorify thee. So as if up to this point I had still said nothing in honor of thy holy mother, give me now the grace to praise thee worthily, in spite of all her enemies, who are thine as well, And grant me to say loudly with the saints, Let not that man presume to look for the mercy of God who offends his holy mother. Make me love thee ardently, so that I may obtain of thy mercy a true devotion to thy holy mother, 
and inspire the whole earth with it, and for that end receive the burning prayer which I offer to thee with St. Augustine and thy other true friends. Thou art Christ, my Holy Father, my tender God, my great King, my Good Shepherd, my one Master, my best Helper, my most beautiful, my most beloved, my living bread, my priest forever, my leader to my country, my true light, my holy sweetness, my straight way, my excellent wisdom, my pure simplicity, my pacific harmony, my whole guard, my good portion, my everlasting salvation. Christ Jesus, my sweet Lord, why have I ever loved, why in my whole life have I ever desired anything except Thee, Jesus, my God? Where was I when I was not in Thy mind with Thee? Now from this time forth do ye all my desires grow hot and flow out upon the Lord Jesus. Run, ye have been tardy thus far, hasten whither you are going, seek whom you are seeking. O Jesus, may he who loves thee not be anathema, may he who loves thee not be filled with bitterness. O sweet Jesus, may every good feeling that is fitted for thy praise love thee, delight in thee, admire thee, God of my heart and my portion, Christ Jesus, may my heart fade away in spirit, and mayest thou be my life within me. May the live coal of thy love grow hot within my spirit, and break forth into a perfect fire. May it burn incessantly on the altar of my heart. May it glow in my innermost being. May it blaze in hidden recesses of my soul, and in the day of my consummation, may I be found consummated with thee. Amen. Our Quest for Happiness The Practice of the Virtue of Religion Religion is the most excellent of the moral virtues. It is the result of the three theological virtues. Religion presupposes the virtue of faith, belief in God, and it must be made living by hope and charity. It is closely related to the cardinal virtue of justice, which inclines the will to give everyone his due. We may define religion as the habit of mind and heart that inclines us to pay to God the worship and reverence due to Him. It is an acknowledgment of the omnipotence of God and of our total dependence upon Him. Adoration, sacrifice, and prayer are the three great acts of religion, and the habit of performing these acts constitutes the virtue of religion. Adoration, the first act of the virtue of religion. Of the principal acts of religion, the first is adoration or worship. This means that with deep respect for the power, majesty, and goodness of God, we acknowledge Him as our first beginning and our last end, and that we consider Him as the absolute Lord and Master upon whom we depend entirely. Man is made up of body and soul, and both must be used to adore God. Hence, adoration must be both exterior and interior. In the old law, the Jews were, for the most part, content with exterior adoration, which consisted in performing external ceremonies. Our Lord upbraided them for this. In later times, some of the heretics went to the other extreme, holding that all worship of God must be internal, that is, in the heart. The Catholic teaching prescribes both. We must pray, we must love God in our hearts, but we must also show by deeds that we love Him by going to Mass, performing works of mercy, and so on. Adoration and veneration. The first commandment obliges us to adore God alone. We give to Him the highest honor, the supreme homage, because He is our sovereign Lord and Master. This worship, which is paid only to God, is given a special name. It is called latria, or adoration. We also pay homage to the saints, but it is inferior to the adoration we pay to God and the veneration we show the Blessed Mother. This veneration of the saints is called dulia, to the Blessed Virgin because of her singular excellence in virtue of her immaculate conception, her divine maternity, and the fullness of her graces, we give a special kind of homage called hyperdulia. The prefix hyper is derived from the Greek and means more, the Blessed Virgin excels all the saints in dignity, sanctity, and glory. Therefore we owe her a higher degree of veneration than we give to the angels and the saints. 
It may be well to recall here the difference between the adoration paid to God and the veneration paid to the Virgin Mary and to the saints. When we pray to the Blessed Virgin and to the saints, we consider them only as intercessors or helpers, and so we say to them, Pray for us, make intercession for us. We adore God alone, we venerate the angels and the saints. We honor and respect images, statues, and pictures. The same instinct which leads us to love and respect a person leads us also to love and respect his portrait. Thus, pictures and images of our Lord and the saints are used in the Catholic Church, in much the same way that family portraits are honored in a home. The saints are our older brothers and sisters, the heroes of our race, who have fought the good fight and now are enjoying the fruit of their labors. It is fitting, therefore, that we show them respect and veneration. Furthermore, the use of pictures and images has definite advantages. Images also help to increase our love for our Lord, His Blessed Mother, and the saints. What miracles of grace have been accomplished by the contemplation of the crucifix, or an ecce homo figure? How much easier it is to concentrate on the mysteries of the rosary, if we have a representation of the scene before our eyes. The use of relics. There is still another point to consider in connection with the topic of veneration, and that is the use of relics. Under the term relics, we include the bodies of saints, their bones, and all objects which were sanctified by contact with them, clothing, religious or other articles which they used, and in the case of martyrs, the instruments of their torture. We honor the relics of the body of a saint because the body was the temple of the Holy Spirit, and a member of the mystical body of Christ. One day it will be raised by God to eternal life and glory. That God approves of the veneration of relics is quite evident from Holy Scripture. The people were anxious to touch the hem of Christ's garment, because all who touched it were saved. Matthew 14.36 In the Acts of the Apostles, we read that people were cured when the shadow of St. Peter fell upon them. There are many saints whose relics God has preserved by a sustained miracle. For example, the tongue of St. John de Pomachine and St. Anthony of Padua. The body of St. Clair. To summarize briefly, we may say, The Lord thy God shalt thou worship, and him only shalt thou serve. However, this worship of God alone does not prevent us from venerating the angels and the saints. They are his friends and in honoring them, we honor God, who made them what they are. Holy Mother Church encourages us to honor not only the saints themselves, but also their images and their relics. This we can do by burning vigil lights or lamps before their statues, by making pilgrimages to their shrines where their relics are preserved, by praying to them, and especially by imitating their virtues. From the House Stops is produced by the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.